Değerli izleyenler, Avrupa Parlamentosu'nun Strasbourg'daki merkezinden bir kez daha selamlar. Bir konuğum daha var ve bugün Avrupa Parlamentosu Yeşiller ve Avrupa Özgür İttifak grubundan Mikulas Peksa ile konuşacağız. Mikulas Peksa, Avrupa Parlamentosu'nun Sanayi, Araştırma ve Enerji Komitesi Başkanı. Dolayısıyla Ukrayna Savaşı ve sonrasında Avrupa Birliği'nin Özellikle enerji politikaları ve tabii ki bizim bölgemizle alakasını konuşacağız. Mr. Peska, welcome to the studio. Thank you for, for uh, accepting my interview. Uh, demand, first of all, I would like to start with Ukraine. What changed after Ukraine uh, for the EU policy on spe specifically uh, energy policy? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I mean, like, uh, Ukraine is a very, very uh, sad story. I mean, like, before that, we quite, like, believed that EU can uh, manage uh, using uh, the fossil fuel deliveries coming from the East. Now we have realized that actually the biggest supplier of fossil fuel we had so far, and that was the Putin's uh, Russian regime, is no longer being to be tr uh, to, it's no longer to be to be trusted i mean like uh, we are talking about stopping the delivery from the russia but at the same time russians can consider it the same and it can effectively happen anytime so uh, i think the most important lesson learned from uh, from now is we can't really rely on fossil fuels because at the end of the day uh, there is always some guy on the other side of the pipeline which can easily like turn the, uh, push the button or turn the, uh, turn the wolf and stop the deliveries and we need to think about it and we need to find a way how to prevent this uh, form of re reliance on someone else uh, for future. But solar, wind and hydrogen, what is next for the future of the, the, the people uh, of the world, I mean on the energy sources? Well, I think you can't like have a general answer because uh, conditions for each and every country are different. I mean, some countries are more tending to, to use the wind, some uh, more tending to, to use the solar. But what we will see is probably a much higher uh, use of uh, renewables. I mean, like uh, the technology uh, moved forward quite fast in the last decade. And now we came to the point, even before the crisis, that the renewables are actually the cheapest solution you have on the market. So just by going for the cheapest and more effective way how to earn energy, you go for deployment of renewables. So I think uh, this effort will be quite like fastened. And of course, like the countries like to the south, like for example, Cyprus will probably use more solar energy. Maybe the countries which are on the uh, northern uh, coast of the uh, of Europe, like close to the Atlantic Ocean, will more often use the wind. But generally, this is the way. Yeah. What what will happen in the upcoming winter? I mean, the, the European countries, where will be uh, uh, buying the, the, the gas energy? It is a very important issue. I think the US is in the first row for that. And there are some agreements already. What what else? Well, the story is always the same. I mean, like at the beginning of October, you are supposed to have the gas reservoirs filled with the gas coming from somewhere. The question is, where do we get this gas over the summer? Because the, this, this is the task to, to get ready for, for the winter. And of course, uh, there we are really in, in this disadvantaged position and we need to find any source that would actually help us to uh, fill the gas reservoirs. But of course, I mean, it's not only about filling the gas reservoirs, because like, uh, whatever you can use to produce electricity instead of burning the gas, is a solution. So uh, as many renewables as we can deploy uh, during the summer will help us to survive this winter. I mean, like, this is really crucial. This winter will be the most challenging one. If we succeed in this winter, then we succeed all the far, uh, subsequent. And I mean, like, when talking about the renewables, uh, I would, just as, just as an example, uh, talk about Germany. They are deploying, just, just during the March, they deployed like 800 megawatts of uh, installed, uh, installed uh, output of renewables. I mean, like, this is just well comparable to uh, one uh, normal sized block of nuclear power plant. I mean, so that's the fast, uh, that, that's, the, that, that's the tempo. I mean, like, they do it every, every month, so to say. Every month, a new reactor. So. Uh, do you think that uh, the, the strategical policies will be changing, including the security policies as well? And what will happen the EU's policy in Middle East, which expecting to drilling and uh, coming out the new uh, gas 
but fossil gas. What is the time limitation for, for the using that after the uh, war in Ukraine? Uh, well, uh, I mean, like we are facing now a steep fall in deliveries uh, through the Eastern Europe, so we need to find other sources. And in that sense, like uh, the Middle East plays a crucial role. I mean, like there, there are sources of fossil gas, and uh, we will probably have to deliver it in some way to Europe. I mean, like probably Cyprus will be one of the uh, transition points for uh, for like uh, delivering uh, gas to Europe. I mean, like that could be sort of like advantage for like uh, earning money th through the transport, but uh, it's definitely not a long-term perspective because in long-term perspective, we need to get rid of fossil fuels. And uh, so for, for this decade, it, it works pretty much well. I think uh, in future, some 2040 uh, or like that, we will probably uh, face the situation that we are uh, getting rid of the fossil gas at all. Um, the, the, the one of the most important thing is the Ukraine war bring a cold war, or we will face uh, new opportunities to find a more peaceful world. Which one is much more uh, close to today's uh, Europe? Well, I have to admit I'm at this point maybe skeptical, but I'm afraid that uh, Russian government cannot be really like considered to, to be a rational player, to be a trustable player. So, I mean, like they are unpredictable and in that situation everyone has to kind of like take care of uh, oneself because uh, we are really, really uh, facing a big uh, uncertainty in the international community. Uh, which means we stick, uh, we have to stick together and we, we need to work together on uh, ensuring security uh, by means of like uh, traditional security but also like the energy security, cyber security and so on. So uh, at that point unfortunately the whole war uh, pushed us into a new world which is probably uh, not that good as the one we lived before but we will have to, uh, we will ha have to face it. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, the economies are getting uh, worse day by day. I mean, the, regarding the, the prices are high mm -hmm. and the, also the economies are uh, getting smaller. Uh, and the, the unemployment rate is uh, going up as well. So uh, is it an opportunity again to, to come together and the, the make the economy much more useful for the, the people? and the EU citizens? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, like, uh, the problem we are facing is the disruption of supply chains. Like, uh, Russia delivered a lot of, like, gas to uh, to Europe, but the gas is uh, subsequently used for, uh, to use, for example, uh, to, to produce hydrogen. Hydrogen is used to produce ammonium, ammonium for production of fertilizers. So there are impacts going into f uh, farther, farther fields. And there we really need to work together to ensure that those chains are being kept and are working so that we do not see further disruptions and further uh, economic depression. So that, that's the most important uh, task, not to start out uh, going for like national uh, isolation and trying to, to keep our own uh, economy without connections to the others, but rather to stay open because uh, the the impact of being closed would be much more harsher than what we do see now. Yeah. On the other hand, we are we have been facing with a big problem on food safety, and uh, what kind of uh, uh, uh, uh, measures we need to take because of the the food safety, especially the the, the people need flour, whatever. Well, when we are talking about Europe, I'm afraid we will see some higher prices. That's uh, the bad part, but I hope we can manage. Uh, what would be worse is the fact that Russia exported also a lot of grain and also Ukraine exported a lot of grain to countries like Egypt or Nigeria and so on. And there it could be a real problem. I mean, like imagine uh, how many people, like it's more than 100 million, are living in Egypt and the country itself has not really like a big fields to uh, be sustainable by means of uh, food production. Should there be not enough food on the international markets, then we will face uh, huge problems, or especially those countries will face huge problems, which will subsequently have impact on the uh, on the whole like 
region, I mean, like uh, everyone around. And I mean, like, it's also in very much in our own interest to ensure that the people in, for example, Egypt are safe and can uh, earn their money to, uh, to get their food. That's, that's very much in our interest because we don't want to have uh, to, to see Egypt to be uh, stable and prosperous. We don't want to see people running from there for, to, to, uh, to get food. So just to summarize it, I, I believe what we need to do now is to ensure that the, those disruptions of food production across the globe will be as much as possible um, managed together. So we should not like try to restrict the exports, but we should uh, be able to share uh, the, the, the uh, food we have uh, uh, with uh, the others on the same global market. And also, uh, do, you th do you think that trade trade possibilities, which is your committee's interest as well, uh, will be grow, but in which way? I mean, the food way or the e-trade way, which way you are uh, thinking that it's called? Cool? Uh, well, we are actually uh, facing, like in economy, it's called supply crisis, which means there is not enough uh, goods on the market. So in general, this is an uh, opportunity for basically everyone who is producing anything, which in Europe, in Europe we are good in. I mean, like we can we can produce a lot. So I, I believe we have the opportunity to uh, really like uh, use this this crisis also as uh, as an opportunity for for us to produce and to to earn money and to uh, ensure our prosperity. We just need to keep the keep the uh, supply chains. Uh, working and uh, the flow of goods uh, running so that uh, everyone has the opportunity to buy what he or she needs. Yeah, in the history we know that when the economy goes worse, uh, the human rights and the nationalism and the uh, such uh, ideas are, are, can be stronger. And uh, do you think that the EU will face some uh, problems with upcoming day, years? Uh, well, uh, I'm afraid this, this is more or less like a uh, normal outcome of any crisis of that type we have seen so far. So probably we will face those type of uh, issues. But at the end of the day, I believe in Europe and I believe in people in Europe who are reasonable and do not uh, do, do, not do uh, such th uh, mistakes like we did in the past. I mean, I believe we do uh, manage better when we work together rather than fighting each other. And I believe there will be significant majority of people who share this opinion and who will rather work together to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, survive the crisis together rather than, uh, rather than start fighting each other and uh, undermining the common effort. And uh, as a media uh, member, I would like to ask you something about the freedoms of the speech and freedom of the press. Um, what do you see in the future of the uh, media? Because media is uh, important, but media is a very important power for everybody. And uh, what can be done for a more free, more uh, um, ethical media uh, for the upcoming the EU years? Uh, well, we need to be able to uh preserve, uh, let's say, the free market for the media. It should not be possible for a single oligarch or dictator or politician to, to simply like control all the media in the country like we do see in Russia, but also in some EU countries like Hungary, for example. So it should be, it should be uh, pluralistic and the media shall stay independent. I mean, like, we probably need sort of like a law even on like the EU level, which would protect journalists against prosecution everywhere in Europe. I mean, like we need to, that for, for various reasons, which are different in different national contexts, but we need to, to, do, do, uh, to have it uh, everywhere. And last but not least, I, I believe we need uh, freedom of the internet. I mean, at the end of the day, the free internet is the most important tool for citizens to uh, really find a different source of information and to be able to compare, to find uh, where, the, where the truth says. Uh, so from my point of view, this, this freedom of internet is something very crucial and we as Pirate Party, we do defend it uh, wherever, uh, wherever possible and we also, we also defend it uh, through, the, uh, through this crisis. Yeah. Finally, may I ask, do you have a message to Cypriots, which is the, the only divided country in the EU? 
um, what kind of message you can deliver for Turkish and Greek speaking Turkish uh, Cypriots? Well, uh, I believe uh, there, there is the same message for everybody. Uh, we should stay together and work together independent of uh, the language or cultural differences we have, because at the end of the day we are all humans and uh, th th this, this whole planet is shared by all of us, so uh, we should work together to preserve it and to survive uh, and flourish on that planet to, uh, together. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. Peksa. Ee, Mikulas Peksa ile konuştuk. Ee, Avrupa Parlamentosu Sanayi Araştırma ve Enerji Komitesi Başkanı, aynı zamanda Çek e, Cumhuriyeti'nden bir parlamenter. E, Sayın Peksa ile enerjiden bölgeye kadar ve Kıbrıs'a kadar her şeyi konuştuk. Strasbourg'dan Avrupa Parlamentosu'ndan bir kez daha teşekkürler, sevgiler.